Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 15th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain the hypocrisy of Senate President Gary Stevens and others in the Senate majority. Second, we discuss what the new national who pays study from the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy says about Alaska. And third, we discuss how those advocating for increased K through 12 spending are in fact pushing for everyone to pay but themselves. And now let's join Michael. So weekly top three, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, an organization dedicated to, well, sustainable budgets. Uh, Brad and I have been fighting this battle for years together. And uh, while we don't always agree, we always are trying to get to the same place. And it's difficult. Uh, And as we start the session, Brad has got some thoughts on this. Uh, I had to laugh when he sent me over the the details this morning or yesterday about uh, this morning. And it, that includes the fact that number one on your list today, Brad, is that the Senate majority does want a gigantic PFD, which I was like, I had to reread that. What? They want a gigantic P, but they only want it for certain people. Tell, tell us, tell me what's going on here, Brad, in your, in your mind. What are you talking about? You know, Michael, as I, as I analyze my reaction to things, I think, I think my biggest outrage and the things that sometimes end up most most times end up on the top three are the hypocrisy that that goes on in the legislator in, in the legislature and, and by legislators. And this week's is a prime example of that. In a in an AP article, Becky Bohr, the AP uh, writer for Alaska, uh, for the legislature at least, uh, writes an article about what's up in the legislature. And on down the article, she gets to a, a the topic of a fiscal plan. Uh, PFD in the fiscal plan. And she interviews Gary Stevens, president of the Senate uh, on the issue. And, uh, and, and Stevens has this quote in there. It says, are we ever going to solve it? Referring to the fiscal plan. Stevens said of the yearly debate, probably not. It's always going to be a battle. And when we have a governor that insists on this gigantic dividend, it's no, no longer large, it's no longer mega, it's now gigantic. On this gigantic dividend in the budget, we will always have that battle uh, with the governor. Well, the hypocrisy of the of the Alaska Senate president talking about gigantic dividends is just too huge for me to for me to to pass by. Let's go back to first principles. First principles are the permanent fund earnings in Hammond's vision. Permanent fund earnings were divided fifty percent to the PFD and fifty percent essentially to enable Alaskans to avoid taxes. They were, they were to pay for government out of this free good, this free bucket of money, the permanent fund earnings pay for government so that Alaskans didn't have to pay taxes. When you go through the numbers, as I've done over the last 10 years, when you go through the numbers, you realize that it's the PFD that's most important to 80% of Alaska families, middle and lower income Alaska families. 
but it's the tax avoidance portion, the, the other half that's most important to the top 20%. The PFD represents a trivial amount of their income, but the tax avoidance dividend, the fact they don't have to pay taxes is huge uh, to them. What's happened over the last several years is as government spending has gone up, as revenues have gone down, as the deficits uh, have, have grown, uh, government has outgrown the ability to cover taxes through that other 50%. So what Hammond originally envisioned was, okay, when we get to that point, we'll reinstitute taxes. We'll, we'll contribute 50% of the permanent fund earnings to avoid taxes. But when we get to the point where that 50% is no longer sufficient to, to, to avoid taxes, we'll reinstitute taxes and we'll try to do it fairly. Um, what's happened, in fact, is when we've got to that point where the 50% no longer enables us to avoid, no longer enables the state to avoid taxes, the, the top 20%, those who are focused on that portion of permanent fund earnings, they don't really care, give a rip about the PFD. Those who are focused on that portion of permanent fund earnings that are used to avoid taxes have said, oh, no, we're not paying taxes. And so to avoid taxes, continue to avoid taxes, what we're going to do is we're going to take more and more and more out of the PF PFD, the portion that's important to the to the to the 80 percent of Alaska families. We're going to take more and more and more out of that so that we can we the top 20 percent can continue to avoid taxes. And as we've seen this creep, as we've seen deficits go up, at, we've seen this creep of, of the portion of the permanent fund earnings that the top 20% want to use to avoid taxes so they can continue to avoid taxes. We've seen this creep of more and more and more of the permanent fund earnings going to, going to, um, going to avoid taxes. So at one point, I did the, I, I delved into it. And this is all, all in a landmine column uh, about this time last year. I delved into it and I said, okay, what's, what's the value of that tax avoidance? What's the tax, what's the, what's the tax avoidance dividend, if you will, to the top 20%? And, and, and it really, what triggered me was, was, you know, legislators kept saying, oh, this gigantic dividend that the, that, that the, that the people on the, that the people on the PFD side want. And so I started calculating how much of, of the top 20% are being protected from taxes, um, from, from a tax burden uh, by using permanent fund earnings more and more and more for the tax avoidance dividend. And you can get up to a, a, a $100,000 in terms of the tax avoidance dividend. If you cut the PFD, if you shift the PFD to 25.75, 25% going to the PFD now, as opposed to the 50-50 Hammond originally envisioned, 25% going to the PFD and 75% going to tax avoidance, the tax avoidance dividend. The benefit to the top one, top 1%, the taxes they are avoiding by taking the PF, by taking a portion of the PFD and using that to cover the cost of government so that they don't have to pay taxes. The tax avoidance dividend of the top 1% is $120,000 per year. That's the benefit of their tax avoidance dividend. If you go to a leftover PFD, which is the PFD's whatever's left over after, after rating it to, to, cover the, 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 to cover the burden of the deficit, if you go to a leftover PFD over the next 10 years, the, ta the value of the tax avoidance dividend of the top 1% is $144,000. Uh, uh, to them. They avoid $144,000 in taxes. Even if you step back and say, okay, that's the top 1%. Give me the average in the, in the top, in the top 20%. At a, at a 50, 50 PFD, the value of the, of the tax avoidance dividend to the top 20, to, to the average uh, uh, family in the top 20%, the average household in the top 20%. The value of the average of the of the tax avoidance dividend is sixteen thousand dollars. The value at a at POMV twenty five seventy five, which is what the Senate's pushing for, is twenty four thousand dollars. That's compared to PFDs of about um, uh, 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 twenty five hundred dollars, three thousand dollars. So the the family the family in the top twenty percent. Average family 
in the top 20% is benefiting from PFD cuts down to 2575 to the tune of $24,000. While the, 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 if you paid the full PFD, the gigantic PFD, according to Gary Stevens, to, to the average family over in the, over in the remaining 80%, they'd get, you know, maybe $3,000, $4,000 out of it. it. The gigantic PFD is not the gigantic dividend. It, that's coming out of the permanent fund earnings is not coming through in the PFD. The gigantic dividend that's coming through is in the form of the tax avoidance dividend that the top 20% are benefiting from. And, and it just outrages me when you've got Gary Stevens, who should understand these numbers, and I'm sure does understand these numbers, when you've got Gary Stevens saying, when we battle, uh, when we have a governor that insists on this gigantic dividend in the budget, th the governor's <laughs> insisting on, you mean, a P on a PFD that's the, minimal compared. You mean the statutory, you mean the law that's on the books, the one that's, that's, that's insisting on including in his budget the statutory PFD that's in the law. Right, right, right. And even, even if, I mean, even if, the, the the statutory PFD was paid. Looking at the calculations we did we did last year, the 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 tax the value of the tax avoidance dividend is still eleven thousand dollars to the top twenty percent. It's twenty one thousand twenty two thousand dollars to the top five percent, and it's fifty thousand dollars. That's if the statute was followed. I mean that's 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 Hammond's original vision. If the statute was followed. The top 20% would still get those sorts of tax avoidance dividends, but that's not enough for them because they would have to pay taxes. Now that we've run the deficits up to the point where the other 50% is no longer sufficient to cover the deficits, that's not enough. The fact they still get a $50,000, the top 1% still gets a $50,000 uh, tax avoidance dividend is, isn't enough. They want all of their potential tax burden covered. And if that means taking money out of the pockets of the remaining 80% of Alaska families, that's fine with them. Because after all, the remaining 80%, that's free money to the other 80%. They don't, they don't deserve that. Well, wait a second. It's free money. Permanent fund earnings are free money. It's free money to you, jokers. It's free money to the top 20% that's being used to cover your tax, your, your tax obligation that's being used for you to, to, to be able to avoid, avoid taxes. But you don't talk about that. Gary Stevens doesn't talk about that. Right. He doesn't talk about the benefits yeah. the top 20% are getting out of the out of the permanent fund earnings split. It's all focused on this PFD and it's all focused on the on taking money from the from the other 80% of Alaska families. And um, the, or, the hypocrisy yeah. is just huge. Unfortunately, Brad, you're the only one that's talking about the top 20%. Nobody else is even really bringing that up. It's like, "Meh, you know, whatever, you know." And and, and unfortunately, I just, you know, this is the thing. I agree with you. I totally agree with you. I see your point. You've got the charts there. I've linked this uh, article from last year up in the chat room where you could look at these charts and you could see the actual numbers laid out there. Um, but nobody else seems to be paying attention to this. Nobody else seems to be following. I mean, they're just like, okay, well, you know, the, the, I mean, it's, it, it, and even yesterday we had Sarah Montalbano on from the Alaska Policy Forum and they don't advocate any new taxes. And I'm like, well, so what's the solution? You know, well, you know, a spending cap and everything and, and God love them. But the problem is we've been crying about the amount of spending in the state for years. We've advocated for cuts and nobody is willing to take that, to take that on, to take on that burden of fighting for lower government. And it's, and we're, we're, you know, we're dying on the vine because of it. That's the thing. We're dying on the vine. I understand the argument. I think many of the listeners understand the argument. Unfortunately, nobody else is picking this up. I mean, nobody else, none of the news media, none of that. I mean, you and I have been talking about the top 20% for the last four years and how they're manipulating this whole situation and how they're the ones that are truly benefiting that nobody asks ask nobody else is asking the question of who pays i mean we're going through all this stuff and it's like we're pissing into the wind you know which is really self defeating unless you're wearing rain gear you know what i mean it's just like this is where we are and i just i you know it is 
it's definitely frustrating. It's definitely frustrating from every standpoint. And you're right. The hypocrisy is just astonished. I mean, this is especially for Gary Stevens, a guy who very plainly is in it for himself. This is the guy that was so incensed that the uh, that the uh, retirement and the benefits board did not include the legislators in the pay raise, so much so that he raised a stink, vetoed the pay raises, did everything else, somehow cajoled the governor into uh, firing essentially the whole board rehiring new people who within two weeks suggested a 80, a 67% legislative pay raise and then got it through. You know, I mean, it, 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 it talk about self-serving. I mean, th this is, yes, it is absolute hypocrisy and it's absolutely frustrating. It is Michael. I, I think part of the problem is, you know, Republicans are imbued with, with the, the, the Reaganism of no taxes. And, and we're going to, you know, whenever you use the word taxes, we're going to fight that. Um, the, and, and the PFD, PFD cuts are not called taxes. They are taxes. As, as Matt Berman from ICER has pointed out, they are, they are taxes. Uh, but, but we don't call them taxes. And so there's something else, you know, we, we don't, we don't have the allergic reaction. Republicans don't have the allergic reaction to them that, that they have to something that, that has the term taxes. And we're also taught, we're also taught that we shouldn't engage in class warfare, that we shouldn't, you know, say you shouldn't lust after, some people would say, shouldn't lust after, you know, the success the top 20% have or the top 5% or the top 1%. That's the American system. If you're successful, you should, you should, uh, you should recognize the, the success uh, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't attack it. Here's the, here's the problem. Here's the problem. The problem is that's right when you earn it, when you earn that that increased salary, or when you when you have those those huge rewards from the stock market, or when you have a business that's highly successful and you and you have high income, when you earn it. But here's what's going on in Alaska. In Alaska, we're taking the free money from free money from the permanent fund earnings, and we're subsidizing the top twenty percent, and we're subsidizing them by taking money taking. The other 50% that was supposed to go to the remaining 80% of Alaska families who really do use it, we're, we're, we're subsidizing the top 20% by taking money from the other 80% of Alaska families to continue this subsidy and, and to continue to, to enable them to enable the top 20% to avoid taxes. So it's not, I mean, my, my attacks on the top 20% aren't, you know, you earned a lot, so you ought to con contribute a lot. That's not it at all. The attack is you guys are getting subsidized by free money and you're getting subsidized by taking that money out of the pockets of the of the other 80 percent. It, it is it, it's 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 not class warfare when the class, the top 30 percent are beating you over the head. I mean, that that's that's essentially what's going on here. They they are using their political power. They're using their status as donors to go in and take money from the other 80% to subsidize themselves. That's wrong. Right. That's, but, that's what we ought to be upset about. It's the modern day robber barons is what it is. And I mean, they're doing a great job of it. I mean, that's the thing. And, and like I said, nobody else is picking it up. So apparently it's the right thing to do. I mean, or something. I mean, that's the, that's the direction they're going. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets is our guest. It is the weekly top three and uh, Brad's fired up this morning for good reason. Uh, you know, this is the, you know, people often ask me when I was on the borough assembly what it was like on the borough assembly. And I was like, well, just slam your hand into a door repeatedly until you're unconscious. And then when you wake up, start again. And that's, I think, what Brad and I have felt like trying to fight this thing for many years, especially with the description of what's going on with the top 20 percent uh, for sure. Uh, but let's move on to number two, Brad, number two of the weekly top three. And that is uh, the big question of who pays. We ask that question all the time. OK, who pays for all this stuff that you want to do? The new programs, the child care and the BSA increase and the and the defined benefits and everything else. Well, ITEP uh, uh, has released a new report, which is, again, their new their report that comes out talks about who pays in the various states and Alaska 
We're number one, baby. Wait, no, it's not the good number one, though. Hit me with it here. Well, it, it Christmas came a little bit late to me this year. Uh, for somebody who loves statistics and loves uh, loves numbers and loves doing calculations, uh, uh, Christmas came after the first of the year when uh, the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy, uh, ITEP, uh, released its new uh, Who Pays study. They don't do this annually. They do it periodically. They hadn't done one since before COVID. Uh, and one was due, and, and I kept looking for it, and finally it came out uh, after the first of the year. And what this study does is go through all of the states, the, the, the state and local tax systems, and looks at, at the regressivity, if you will, the, 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 the way in which those tax systems are slanted you know, against, the, against middle and lower income Alaska families, or progressivity, slanted against, uh, against the top 20%, looks at the slope if you will, um, of, uh, of the state and local tax burdens. And it's, it's always enlightening to see not only where Alaska ranks relative to the others, but, but also, you know, re what's really going on in some other states. This year, they added a, a, a new piece, uh, a regressivity index, uh, which enables you to calculate uh, uh, the regressivity of, of various components um, and sort of take a deeper look, if you will, at what's at what's going on. And they also rank the states as they normally do. They also rank the states in terms of regressivity to progressivity. Who's who's the most regressive? Got the most regressive tax burden. Who's got the most progressive tax burden? Uh, and who's sort of right in the middle? You know, the the place that I'd like to be the the flat tax, the you average tax, not, right? Yeah, people. Um, and sort of enables you to look at that. Um, they did not include, for Alaska, they did not include PFD cuts uh, as one of the factors. And that's because PFD cuts are so unique to Alaska. It really, it's, it's hard to explain why you would include them. So they just didn't include them. But there's enough information in the report and enough information that I know that, that you, can, you can learn about the PFD when you study it. There's enough information to do the calculations to figure out uh, where Alaska falls when you include the PFD. Here's here's the the rankings uh, in the normal rankings without including the PFD. Alaska is number twenty uh, in terms of regressive in terms of regressivity. Florida is number one with a regressivity index of minus nine point two percent. You can go into the ITEP report and understand how they calculate that. Uh, it's fairly it's fairly common sense. It's the difference basically the difference between. Uh, 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 the the tax burden on the top one percent, the tax burden on the on the middle income, and the tax burden on the on the lowest twenty percent. What the difference is, and the regressivity index for Florida, who's number one in the in the report, is minus uh, nine point two. Alaska comes in without including the PFD cuts, uh, comes in at number twenty with a regressivity index of minus four point four. Not great, not bad, just sort of you know it's in the middle third. Um, uh, of the nation. But when you include PFD cuts, which is what, uh, uh, which is what you're able to do now with the, with all the information that's out there, both in their report, as well as, uh, as well as uh, our, our understanding of the PFD generally, when you look at PFD cuts, PFD cuts alone, standing alone, let's assume Alaska had no other taxes, just PFD cuts, the regressivity index of PFD cuts alone is minus 11.2%. Higher than number one, higher than Florida's regressivity index, standing alone. Alaska also has uh, also has a regress has a regressive tax system separate and apart from PFD cuts. That's why we rank number 20. That's why we have a minus 4.4% regressivity index um, uh, when you don't include the PFD. So when you layer in the, the, the other tax burdens that Alaska has, the sales taxes at the local level, property taxes at the local level, uh, the fees that you've got uh, at, the, at the state level, when you layer those in and, and then add on the PFD cuts, Alaska's regressivity index is minus 16.2%. Clearly, far and away, number one, in the nation, most regressive tax system um, in the nation, almost double, not quite, but almost double the other, the, the number one in the ITEP report, Florida at 9.2%. At 16.2%, at 16 Alaska clearly blows everybody else away 
in terms of the most regressive tax system. The, the tax system most biased against middle and lower income Alaska families. The tax system that ICER told us in the 2016 study, because of its regressivity, has the largest adverse impact on the, on the overall Alaska economy. Clearly, Alaska is uh, number one in that. And even standing alone, just PFD cuts alone, assuming, assuming away the, the remainder of the Alaska tax system, we're number one, even with just PFD cuts at, at minus 11.2%. Again, you know, it, if, if, if this was, if, if somehow everybody was treated, being treated equally, okay. I mean, that's, we got a regressive tax system. We're just going to have to live with it. But that's not what's going on. Going back to the first segment, what's going on is we're taking money out of middle and lower income Alaska families to subsidize the top 20% so that they don't have to pay any taxes at all, to subsidize their, their tax avoidance uh, dividend. So it's just, I mean, it, 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 is, it is grating to see Alaska uh, uh, at that level because of that system, because of a system that's subsidizing the top 20% at the expense uh, of the remaining 80%. But, you know, setting, setting all the philosophy aside, the numbers now clearly show that, that including PFD cuts, Alaska is the most regressive tax system in the nation. You know, people people objected when Matt Berman said uh, uh, that uh, the PFD cuts, when Matt Berman from ICER said last year that PFD cuts are the most regress, re, regressive tax system ever proposed. Some people said, oh, no, there's, you know, sales taxes can be more regressive or or property taxes, if they're done a certain way, can be, can be more regressive. No, this clearly shows that PFD cuts indeed are the most regressive tax system uh, that's ever that's ever been proposed anywhere uh, in the United States. So we found we've got the numbers to back it up. But but again, we are the only one we're the only ones that are talking about this. Matt Berman came out with that article, and as you said, he got the hell beat out of him because oh no, it, you know they, it's like they didn't argue on 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 the taxation portion of the PFD. They got down into the brass tax of oh well, there are others that are more regressive. They but they couldn't argue with the point that it is essentially a tax. So again nobody else is really talking about this. Nobody else is really talking about the more you take the PFD, the more you disconnect the public and the private economy. Nobody else is really talking. I mean, all these other things are like, oh, it'll all be fine. Don't worry. Nothing to see here. Move along. Well, Michael, when you've got a legislature that gave itself a raise that put all of them in the top 20%, even the even those that wouldn't earn that in the private sector, put them in the, put those legislators uh, even in the in the top 20 percent, when you've got a, a system that does that, when you've got a, a system that is has unrestricted donations, political donations. So the top 20 percent can virtually finance anybody's campaign uh, just on their just on their own bottom. All you have to do is, you know, call up three or four or five or six donors and you've got your campaign campaign financed. You don't have what we don't we don't have now what we used to have, which are limitations that force candidates to go out and sell themselves, make themselves palatable to a broad specter. Now they only have to go out and, you know, and, and satisfy two or three donors and they get enough money uh, to finance to finance their campaigns. When you've got a system that's moved all the legislators into the top 20 percent, when you've got a system that enables that, that has unlimited political donations, you've got a system that has just it's not Republican or Democrat. It is it is. It, it, it is, you know, the 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 old power baron or the old the old robber baron. You've got a system that's turned Alaska into the old robber baron system. Well, and this is what we talked about early in the year. I mean, this is not a question of, you know, Republicans versus Democrats. Those labels don't really apply in this state. It is a, you know, do you want larger government? you know, more invasive, more expensive? Do you want larger government or do you want less government? That's what it's really about. That's the, do you want the good old boys? Do you want the business as usual crowd? Or do you want to change things up of the way things are done? That's what we should be looking at these days. I mean, quit looking at the, at the, at the party labels because they mean nothing essentially uh, for many of the players that are in there right now in our government. The question is, do you want 
government to control the economy and government to control the spend and to, to the government economy to be what everything's all about? Or do you want a robust private economy that employs people, creates entrepreneurship, does that, has government out of their hair, less occupational licensing, less regulation? Less, that's really the two groups that are in there right now. And of course, the group that's winning is the business as usual robber baron crowd. And the top 20%, Alaska's top 20% has sold out. I mean, not, not to a man. There are some who fight this, but but they have sold out. And why have they sold out? Because, because the deal has been struck. And you can see this going all the way back to Natasha. You can see this going all the way back into the into the mid-20 teens. We, we've, they've struck a deal that as long as they don't get taxed, as long as we use PFD cuts, as long as we tax middle and lower income Alaska families to pay for this growing government, the top 20% won't object. That's the deal. That's that's the deal that, that you see come through clearly in the legislature. That's the deal you see clearly come through in the trade associations. As long as you don't tax us, as long as you, and, and in the case of the old industries, you don't, as long as you don't tax us more, as long as you don't tax us, we'll let you spend whatever you want and we'll let you take it out of the PFD. And if that means the PFD goes from the statutory PFD to POMB 5050, which is about a what a $600 million cut in the PFD right there. And, and then POMB 5050 doesn't work. So POMB 75 or 2575, or if that doesn't work, then leftover PFD. If, 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 if that's what it takes, the top 20% tells themselves, if that's what it takes, We'll live with that because that means the Democrats and that means other people won't come after, have agreed that they won't come after and tax us. Why do you see, why do you see uh, Zach Fields, the most liberal uh, representative in the legislature? Why do you see Zach Fields write op-eds about, uh, about cutting the PFD, that, that we need to cut the PFD, that's a good thing. We're putting this money into government. We're putting this money into schools. We're putting this money into... Why do you see Zach Fields write those op-eds? Because the top 20% has made the deal with Zach Fields. We'll let you spend on whatever you want to spend on. We'll put up sort of a fight, but we'll let you spend on whatever you want to spend on as long as you don't come after us uh, to pay for it. As long as you take it out of the pockets, of middle and lower income Alaska families. That's that's the deal that's been cut in Alaska. And and it's not Democrat or Republican. I mean, Democrats are as part as much part of the problem as Republicans are. But who's paying the who's paying for all that? It's lower is middle and lower income Alaska families. And according to the ICER 2016 study, it's the overall Alaska economy that ends up that ends up paying the burden. So the top 20% don't have to pay taxes and, and the Democrats can go spend on whatever they want to spend on. Tell me how you really feel, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Just tell me how you really feel. I, Gary Stevens, I mean, the, the gigantic P. I I was sort of going along with large PFDs, mega PFDs. Okay, all right. If that's, but gigantic, I mean, that's what triggered me. That, that when I read that over the weekend, I was, I was in another, another. Could we, yeah. Could we say gigantic pay raise at the same time? I mean, that's the, you know, that, but that's okay. That's okay. We can justify that. Um, eh, Randy, I love you so much, brother. But seriously, Randy says PFD cuts are not a true tax. Most people know that. Randy, I'm just going to tell you this. I'm going to take the word of an ICER member, a professor uh, of university, an expert in taxation and those kind of I'm going to take his word for it over yours when he says this is really a tax even though they don't call it a tax, this is really a tax. I mean, you know, God love you, brother, but I'm just not going to, uh, I'm just not going to stand around for that. Uh, that I mean, that, that's, that's part of the problem, right? I mean, Randy's not in the top 20%, but but Randy ha is, has drunk the Kool-Aid about, hey, it's okay to take my PFD um, and, and thinking you're taking my PFD and you're going to spend more on government. That's not what's going on, Randy. What's going on is they're taking your PFD and they're insulating the top 20% more from having to pay for government. It, it, the dollars that they're taking from your pocket are effectively dropping through to the dollars in, the, in Natasha's pocket because she doesn't have to pay taxes that she otherwise would if we, pay, if we paid your PFD. And, and Natasha is growing richer and richer and richer and richer while you're growing poorer and poorer and poorer. And you're loving it. 
I mean, that's that's the part that I don't get. You know, people say, yeah, whack me some more. I mean, it's, come on. This is what's going on, people. The top 20% are using you. Well, it's the same argument to say, well, I'm all for the PFD as long as we have a balanced budget. As long as there's a PFD and there's money to draw from, you're ne- they're always going to spend it. It's all the money that's available to them and then some. They're never going to say, well, you know, we've got some extra money in the PFD. And we should just give that to the people. No, no, I've got a special project that I need to be paid for over here. Or I need to do this or I need to do that or define benefits or the schools. or wh- I mean, it's always something. There's always something else that's going to be paid for. Um, I mean, that's that's part of the problem. That's why you've got to have a spending cap on top of a if you do get the PFD constitutionalized and protected, you've got to have a spending cap because otherwise they will create more taxes. Uh, Even if you had a flat tax today, they would spend every dollar of it unless there is some kind of governor on top of that with like a, a, you know, a spending cap, because otherwise you're just going to spend all the available money and then some. I don't, I don't disagree with that, Michael, but there's going to be a sea change. If Natasha had to pay $50,000 in taxes, which is what she should have to pay in order to preserve, in order to, in order to observe uh, Hammond's original 50, 50 split. If Natasha had to pay $50,000 in state taxes, and that's a flat tax, that's not a progressive tax. I'm not trying to tax the rich, soak the rich. It's a flat tax. Everybody pays the same. If Natasha had to pay $50,000 in taxes, she would be at the front, at the bleeding edge of saying, stop that spending. We can do this better. Stop spending. We can do schools better. We can do roads better. We can do other things better. Stop that spending. But because she doesn't have to pay it, because she's getting rich out of Randy's Randy's PFD that he's willingly given up, um, she's not saying that. She's not saying stop that spending. She's saying, yeah, I understand. You got to spend more on schools. You got to spend more on infrastructure. You got to spend more on whatever the hell the next thing is that they come up with. I understand that. I don't have to pay for it. So, you know, I don't care. If she had to pay $50,000, if she had to pay $75,000 in taxes, we would have a much different state than, than, than we've got right now. We would have a much more conservative, a much less costly, a much more uh, 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 business type run state, but because she doesn't have to pay taxes, she's been at the forefront of, okay, let's spend more. Right. Right. And maybe Donna's argument here will help Randy. She says, okay, PFD cuts are not taxes or they would have an equal protection problem. PFD cuts are however, confiscatory. So they act like taxes only worse because they don't have an equal protection. Uh, again, taxes are, you know, when, when you have an official tax, they at least try for some kind of equitability. But in this case, it's not. There is no equitability protection on that. And it is, in fact, regressive and affecting the lower uh, 80% more than the upper 20%. That's just the bottom line in that regard. So I don't know if that helps you, Randy, or not. Um, Harold hey, says, hey. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Randy just wants to give his money to Natasha. I mean, it's just, you've got people like that. And that's, and so Gary Stevens, when Gary Stevens is going to give a speech about this, he's going to point to Randy. He's not, I mean, that's part of the problem, Michael. We've got right there. You've got people in the bottom 80% who say, yeah, it's fine. Take my PFD. I don't care. Yeah, no, exactly. And of course this, it can't be in a vacuum. It's got to be, it's got to be a multi-pronged approach. You've got to have a spending cap on top of that. Cause even if you go to a flat tax, they'll spend every dollar. And then some, if you go in and take more oil dollars as Harold advocates, sure. They'll just spend it all. You've got to have some, you've got to have some spending controls in there as well. The Michael Duke show common sense radio, Brad Keithley is our guest. The weekly top three continues. We're on to number three which is the discussion on K-12 spending. Uh, Of course, we all saw the pictures from the weekend in Anchorage where the newspaper gushed about hundreds, hundreds of people, multiple hundreds. And every picture I looked at, there may have been 100 people there, but they made it sound like it was multiples of 100. Everybody's wearing red. Everybody's all about it. Of course, it's the unions that are out there and Joel Hall and all that other stuff. But Brad wants to talk about those who are pushing for increased K through 12 funding, uh, funding, want everyone to pay except for them. I'm sensing a theme here. 
I'm I'm sensing a theme that everyone pays except for those top. Brad, give give me give me your thoughts on this. There is there is a theme. Uh, once I saw Gary Stevens' quote, I, I was on I was on a roll. There is a theme here. When you look at the speakers uh, uh, who spoke in in at the Anchorage, uh, whatever you want to call it, the Anchorage uh, uh, BSA rally, BSA rally. Thank you. The, at the Anchorage BSA rally, when you look at the speakers, every one of them is in the top twenty percent. Every one of them is is saying, you know, uh, increase the BSA, reverse the veto, override the veto, increase increase K through twelve spending, and the subtext of every one of those speakers was, and I don't have to pay for it. <laughs> well, and every one of them is a direct recipient of a benefit from increasing the BSA. Every one of them teachers, administrators, union members, everyone. Because again, nobody wants to mandate that the BSA increase goes directly into the classroom. They don't care. You know, and some of it, some places, the BSA, less than 50% of the BSA is going into the classroom. So they are direct benefit. It's a hypocrisy. It's even worse hypocrisy than the Gary Stevens situation because no. they're down there saying, give me money. No, there is no more worse hypocrisy than Gary Stevens. <laughs> I'm not going to concede that, <laughs> but, but it is, it is huge. It's a huge hypocrisy. It's huge hypocrisy. I mean, teachers themselves, the average, the, the span of, of, of teacher pay in this state, beginning teachers are in the middle and lower income brackets, right? They're, they're not in the top 20% yet. Senior teachers are in the top 20%, but, but, but beginning and sort of, you know, early in your career, teachers are not in the top 20%. So they're essentially, their, their reps are saying, Take money from them, take money from their pockets and move it into, you know, the top 20 percent's pockets by by not having not having to pay taxes. Now, true, teachers will benefit from from the BSA increase. And so they get some of it back. Those teachers get some of it back. But Randy and others don't get any of it back. You're just moving money into the into the pockets of the of the K through 12 you know, industry. Uh, and um, and not getting any of it back, like at least some teachers are. So, but it, but it's just, I mean, every one of them, every one of them who spoke and said we need to increase funding, we need to override the veto, we need to pass increased BSA funding. It just the hypocrisy of it. As I as I as I watched the videotape, as I as I read the articles, and as I worked through who the speakers were, the hypocrisy of every last one of them being in the top 20% and not being and 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 you know arguing for this knowing they're not going to have to pay for it that it's going to come out of out of the other 80%'s pockets that just that was just you know overwhelming to me it it we we don't have us we we don't have personal responsibility in this state we've got a state where now we've got our leaders our leaders all of whom are saying yeah spend more on this spend more on that do more this way do more that way but don't don't make me pay for it. I mean, take it out of the pockets of of Randy. I mean, he's willingly giving it up. Take take it out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. Don't make don't make me pay for it. And they have no sense of personal responsibility. Jesse Bjorkman gets up there, you know, state senator from Kenai, uh, gets up there and says, "Oh, my little Tommy is in a class with thirty. I don't want him in a class with thirty. He needs to be in a class with, you know, with twenty or or or, or less. Uh, class size is a problem." You know, give me money, give me your money <laughs> so that so that my Tommy can 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 be in a be in a smaller class. Never notwithstanding the fact that Jesse, Jesse's in the top 20 percent himself. He doesn't have to pay for it. It's you know, we got a clause in the Alaska Constitution that says that 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 citizens are have a have a shared responsibility to each other. Right. Our leaders don't believe that. What they believe is the is the is the other eighty percent has a responsibility to them, right? And 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 their responsibility is that ah, we don't have any responsibility. We well, have a responsibility to ask for more and more and more, but 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 we don't have any responsibility to pay for it. Well, and talking about responsibility and accountability, I mean, there were discussions during the last half uh, last half of the session where they're like, okay, 
well, we can vote for this BSA, but you got to put some accountability measures in there that they've got to hit certain metrics or things have got to go. And that was a non-starter. That was that got zero votes. That got voted down hard. We don't want to put accountability into these dollars that you're that we're asking for or that we're not just asking for. We're demanding. We're demanding these dollars. And don't you dare put any accountability on it, even though. We're 48th and 49th and all the NEEP scores and everything else. Uh, but that doesn't matter. We just we just have to have more money to fix it. But don't put any accountability on us on top of that. Uh, Cindy says in the chat room, she said she saw this on the news, watched the news broadcast of the BSA rally is what she's talking about. And she said, um, uh, she said, I saw this on the news. None of the teachers interviewed ever mentioned the kids. It was all about them and their salary. It sounds like Gary Stevens, but even the teachers, they don't understand half of that money never makes it to the teachers or the classroom. It's go, it's getting sucked up by overhead. It's getting, I mean, when you've got two to three administrators for every teacher, who do you think is going to get the lion's share of that? Even if you split it equally, if you've got two administrators for every teacher, they're only getting a third of it. If you've got three, then they're only getting a quarter and all the and, and what's going on with the administrative numbers across the state and has over the last 20 years. The administrative numbers are skyrocketing up and the teacher numbers are going down. Well, that's and the student enrollment is going down. Why? Well, because they found a way to create the education industrial complex. If you want to you know, borrow a phrase, that's what's going on. It's about protecting those jobs, those positions, those hires, and the unions are all about that because they get paid. What the more people you put in there, the more money they get paid. You know, the school boards. Uh, 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 Rob Myers pointed made a point to me yesterday that I think is a good one. He said that the school boards that have hit the max, right, uh, or even the school boards that haven't hit the max that don't want to put any more in it. What they're what the school boards are essentially saying is, I don't, I, I either can't because I've hit the max, or I don't want to tax my region anymore uh, for uh, uh, for increased uh, for increased K through 12 spending. But, you know, there's this this state up there that I can go to. I don't have any responsibility for it. I don't I'm in the top 20 percent. I don't have to pay for it. There's this state I, I can go to and say it's the state's fault. The state won't give me the money. I would love to give you more money, teachers. I would love to have a defined benefit program. I would love to be, you know, Santa Claus for you, but I can't do it. Because I either can't tax my people anymore, or or they won't they won't pay any more uh, in taxes to pay for it. But the state, go 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 complain to the state. So you get all these school board members up there who are saying you need to you need to pay more. Well, you know, have some responsibility, have some personal responsibility in the stake, and then I'll listen, and then I will listen to you. I mean, if right. if, if Jesse Bjorkman says we need to tax ourselves. To, to, to pay for increased K through 12. I'll listen to him. But as long as he's saying, we need to cut the PFD, we need to take more money out of middle and lower income Alaska families in order to increase uh, the K through 12 spending. It's just, I mean, it's self-serving to the max. I'm not trying to beat up on Randy, but Randy is the poster child for what the rest of the state is going through. Because they're all like, oh, don't tax me. Go ahead and take my PFD, don't tax me. Not realizing that essentially, they are. I mean, it's a billion plus. If they took the whole PFD, it's what, $1.3 billion in taxes? If they take the whole PFD, uh, it's more, and it's, it's more than that. Four, four? What is it? 2.4, two, two, two point, two point I think. Is the two anyway, it's a huge number. It's a huge number in taxes. And if they're all running around like, oh, don't tax me. Well, you, you know, take that PFD. Don't tax me. It'll be fine. It is a tax. It's confiscatory. I mean, Donna's right. I mean, it's like they've taken it away and they're going to spend every dollar of it. And do you think, based on their track record, that after they take the PFD completely, do you think that they're just going to stop there and go, oh, well, we're out of money now? Do you think Michael, that's going to happen? Michael, it's not that they've spent it. I mean, I mean, even, even if they've spent it, then... Yeah, I'm being taxed unfairly, but I'm taxed unfairly in a lot of ways. You know, I, I sort of agree to agree to, to go along with it. It's not that. It is it you're being taxed to protect the top 20% from being taxed. You're being taxed, money's being taken out of your bank account so that money can stay in the bank accounts of the top 20%. You're giving up 
you know, winter fuel or you're giving up whatever you would use your PFD for. So the top 20% can take another trip to Hawaii. That's, that's what's going on here. That's the infuriating thing that's going on. If all of us were being taxed and all of us were being taxed roughly proportionately, even if we were using a sales tax that's slightly regressive, if all of us were being taxed, okay. Yeah. All right. Let's fight about what we're being taxed about. But at least the top 20 percent are in the fight then. But that's not what's going on. R dollars are being taken out of Randy's pocket to, to stay in Natasha's pocket. Randy is subsidizing Natasha. That's what's going on. And that's the infuriating thing about this. We're not all in this together. The top 20 percent through PFD cuts has figured out a way where the, where the other 80% are in this and they don't have to be. That's, that's what's going on. And that is, to me, the, the thing that's most infuriating about it. It's it, the 80% are being taken advantage of. They're being played for fools. And, and, and they're willing, and some, Randy, are willingly going along with it. I, right. That's just, I mean, yeah. I don't know. It just it just drives me crazy to to see that happening to see and and to see that to see the eighty percent being taken advantage of and on top of that according to the twenty sixteen ISER study that approach has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy so not only is it Randy being played a fool it it we are hurting our own economy you know we talk about Republicans talk about oh the economy everything's about the economy well guys. You're voting for a system that has the largest adverse impact on the right. overall economy. Well, we got to define what the economy is for many of these Republicans is that, you know, it's the government, right? I mean, it's the government spend. That's the economy in many of these people's minds. As long as the government economy is doing fine, everything else is gravy because they don't care what happens in the private economy because they're, you know, and many of them are receiving their funds they're double dipping because they're receiving what was the comment that uh uh that rob made uh earlier he said some people are getting subsidized twice because they're making their money from the state in the first place right gary 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 stevens gary stevens yeah. being, being a great example yeah again that is the whole point um and it's <laughs> It, 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 it's it's frustrating because, you know, we can see it. And then, there the, again, the folks are out there like, um, uh, you know, the, the folks like Randy again. Oh, Randy says, pay the P biggest PFD possible. Just make sure everything fits within a balanced budget. No deficit spending. If you want a bigger PFD, then advocate for spending. But again, that's like Randy's <laughs> argument that give them as much money as they want and they'll learn fiscal responsibility. <laughs> That was, an, that was an argument that he had years ago with me. He said, oh, you just we just give them the money they want. They'll eventually learn fiscal. It's like giving a teenager a limitless credit card and say, you know, control your spending. Are you kidding me? Just give them everything they want and they'll eventually learn. You want to pay a PFD, just make sure it fits within a balanced budget. If you give them the option to take it, they they have. What's the track record? They will spend all of that and then more. As long as and, and 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 add on top of that, Michael, as long as they don't have to, as long as they don't have to pay for it. I mean, that's what's going. I mean, Randy says advocate advocate for budget cuts. Shit, we have for uh, I'm not sure. Well, we're not on the air. I, we have for you know a decade, more than a decade, going back to the to the late 2000s, 2008. We could see this going on. 2007, 2006, we could see this going on. We've advocated. That yeah. for a long time. The problem, Randy, is not everybody is in the same situation. The top 20% have figured out how to insulate themselves from paying for any of it. So they don't care. And they don't care because they're taking money out of your pocket and keeping it in their pocket. They don't care. If you get all of us to care, we'll push back on spending. Spending will go down. But as long as the top 20%, the donor class, those who can buy and sell legislators, those who are legislators themselves, all of them are in the top 20%. As long as they don't have to pay for it, they don't care. Right. And, and that's, and, and that's where, that's what we've gotten to in this state. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's frustrating. I mean, it's been 10 years now that Brad and I have been. 2014 is when he and I started talking to legislators, asking them specifically if they could cut it down to the ICER numbers of 3.9, then 4, then 4.1 billion. They all agreed and then nothing happened. It's it's ultimately frustrating. Brad, we're out of time. we got to go. Thank you so much for coming on board. It's good to talk with you, my friend. Michael, thanks for still having me. <laughs> go Go have some blood pressure medicine. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three. 